Humanitarian aid is coming from all corners of the globe to help Lebanon after that devastating explosion in Beirut. French President Emmanuel Macron hosted a virtual conference today to drum up more funds. Representatives from the UK, China, Russia, Jordan and Egypt are among the countries who took part. Here in Canada, the government says it will match donations from Canadians up to $2 million. As Philip Lee Shannock tells us, it's unclear just how long Lebanon will need help. A Toronto's Global Medic volunteers packed 10 kilogram sealed buckets of food. Included inside, long grain rice, chickpeas and green lentils. Global Medic's Raul Singh says this is just the first round of international aid. I think your food insecurity in Lebanon will last for a couple of years because of this crisis. If we think we're going to get through it in a month or two, we're kidding ourselves. Nobody knows what will happen over the next few days. Martin Koilertz is an assistant professor in the food security program at the American University of Beirut. He says Lebanon's main grain silo has been destroyed, leaving the country with just enough food for over a month. But with a government known to be corrupt and slow to respond, food aid may not make it to the people who need it most. You do find partners on the ground. Also, there's a great NGO, the World Food Program, which is very active in Lebanon due to the refugee crisis, which has been going on for the past almost 10 years. Philip Lishanok, CBC News, Toronto. If we get sued, it's somebody that doesn't want people to get money. Okay? And that's not going to be a very popular thing. U.S. President Donald Trump looks to be gearing up for another legal battle, this time over COVID-19 relief. After Congress failed to agree on a new stimulus package this week, Trump signed a number of executive orders extending coronavirus benefits for unemployed Americans. But some law experts and lawmakers say he can't do that on his own. The number of COVID-19 cases in the U.S. now exceeds 5 million. Around the world, over 19.6 million cases of COVID-19 have been reported, along with more than 726,000 deaths. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has some good news today about her country's response to the global pandemic. New Zealand has been free of COVID-19 for 100 days, but Ardern warns people should not become complacent. 100 days is a significant period of time, but it actually doesn't lessen any of the risk. Uh, that's daily, as long as we are continuing to, of course, uh, exist in a world where this pandemic is, is growing, uh, then risk continues. But it, it is a milestone. New Zealand's successful fight against the virus makes it one of the safest countries on Earth right now. The ongoing closure of the U.S.-Canadian border has cut off a teenage boy from all his friends. The boy lives in a tiny Alaskan community that's only accessible through B.C. Betsy Trumpener reports. I guess isolated would be the best word. It's pretty lonely. Ronnie Olnick lives in Hyder, Alaska, population 63. He's one of just three teenagers in the village. All of his friends live just a few kilometers away in Stewart, B.C., now, they're on the other side of an international border that's been closed for months. Yeah, I've been pretty sad lately. I mean, I'm so used to always going over there and going to their house and having a fire. It's been pretty hard. Before the pandemic, Olnick and his friends crossed back and forth all the time. Now he's allowed into Canada just once a week for three hours for essential business. He's not allowed to socialize or see his friends. Community leaders are calling for Canada and the U.S. to reopen the crossing to locals. In a remote area with no confirmed COVID cases, they say they want to build a cross-border bubble. Betsy Trumpener, CBC News, Prince George. And that is your World This Hour. For CBC News, I'm Jasmine Sepiotis. Is that all the news? Come on, CTV. Come on. 
whole CTV. This is DW News, and these are our top stories. A Lebanese government minister has resigned in reaction to anger on the streets of Beirut. The protests following Tuesday's devastating explosions left at least one police officer dead and more than 100 injured. The minister said she was quitting because of the government's failure to carry out reforms. A council of Afghan tribal leaders has agreed to free 400 Taliban prisoners, clearing the way for peace talks. The government says those talks are on the verge of beginning. The Taliban has made the release of the prisoners a condition for those talks. Belarus is voting in the closest run presidential race for decades. President Alexander Lukashenko has been in power since the 1990s, but this time around he's facing a serious challenge from Svetlana Tikhonovskaya, the wife of a jailed presidential candidate. More than a 1,000 people were detained ahead of the election. This is DW News from Berlin. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at DW News or visit our website, DW.com. Something's wrong with the news today. This is my favorite conspiracy. They don't want me to listen to you. I'll be right back. Florida finds itself in a harsh spotlight. The state was one of the first to reopen. Now, it's breaking records for new infections. Florida reported more than 15,000 new cases yesterday. That shatters the one-day record for any state. ICU bed capacity in Miami-Dade County, the epicenter of the nation's new epicenter, now at nearly 92% and rising. The volume of COVID patients coming to the hospital is five times higher than it was a month and a half ago. We spoke to one of the leaders in the emergency department who said, listen, we have seven ICU beds available, but we're doing everything we can to ride that wave right now and not get overwhelmed by the patients who keep coming in day after day. Florida's got 500,000 cases and counting. Their daily case tolls have outnumbered continental Europe. Something like 8,000 people have died. Veronica Sarakovia, you've been covering this crisis for WLRN Public Radio in Miami. How did things get so bad there? Florida had the heads up. Right. For one thing, Florida was late to close down and reopen too soon. And in March, the governor had not yet ordered a shutdown of a lot of businesses. And so people had actually started staying at home on their own. And that helped Florida a bit for a while as New York got really bad. But once it reopened, I mean, we recently had Disney World do a partial reopening. The Mickey Mouse and Tinkerbell meet and greet are not happening right now, but you can find Mickey, Minnie, the whole Fab Five, Tinkerbell, and all the characters you want to see pretty much all around the park. It's like a special magical surprise. And the Major League Soccer had a tournament in Orlando. MLS confirmed today that six players from FC Dallas have tested positive for the coronavirus. This Florida has been reopening 
things where people are gathering when it doesn't have a control over the spread of this disease. Shopping malls are open and you'll see, you know, parking lots full of people. And the other problem too is that there's no statewide mask mandate. And so um, it's up to mayors to set these and, and it's, I think, very confusing for people. And Florida is a state where people tend to live close to their families and that's caused a lot of problems with younger people visiting parents and grandparents and, and spreading the virus or just people celebrating graduations or, you know, it's summertime and people want to be together with friends. And so I guess that's a bunch of reasons, but the way this has been managed has just been very confusing and um, no strong leadership to get these numbers down. What's the governor doing now that you guys are setting records and that Florida has become like the global epicenter of the coronavirus? The governor has been working on improving the testing because that's been a, a big problem that he's recognized that for a while people were waiting two, sometimes three, even four weeks to get the results back. And of course, during all of that time, people are going around spreading the virus um, until they know if they have it or not. And so this week we now have some more rapid testing. It's a 15-minute test for people who are either 65 and older or for children or for people who have symptoms. And there has been a slight improvement in money allocated for contact tracing. That's also been a really big problem. The state just really um, has had a lot of problems getting its contact tracing going. And so that effort, which has really helped in other states and other countries to get people to isolate at home, just really hasn't been present here in Florida to the extent that it should, given the population size. And Florida's got a lot of retirees. Are elderly people being hit harder than others in Florida? Some of the hardest hit people have been those who live in nursing homes or assisted living facilities. And that's because a lot of the certified nursing assistants who work at these nursing facilities, they work more than one job for a, a lot of them. I've spoken to union representatives who tell me they earn about $12 an hour, and so they have um, exposure by working at more than one place. A lot of them don't have health insurance, and so it's been really a big problem in terms of the spread at nursing homes. And so at one point, more than 50% of the deaths in the state were at these facilities. And Governor Ron DeSantis has been talking a lot about this new effort underway. Uh, we uh, have created over the period of the last few months uh, 23 COVID-only nursing facilities uh, that have over 1,500 beds. And these are facilities that can be used uh, to transfer a COVID-positive resident uh, out of a nursing home to a place where they could be uh, properly isolated. Uh, they could also be discharged from the hospital to a COVID-only facility, even if they're still COVID positive, because the facility is set up to deal with that, and you don't run the risk of putting them uh, in a regular nursing home and spreading it amongst the seniors. So to be clear here, they're taking people who have COVID out of hospitals and sending them to like COVID-only nursing homes? Exactly. And they actually, this was done in New York State um, in other states as well. In New York, at first, it had been mandated on nursing homes to take patients. In Florida, the nursing homes agree to it because they're going to get more reimbursement money from the state for taking these patients. So somebody who's an older person who lives, let's say, in a nursing home, they cannot, by state rules, they cannot go back to that permanent nursing home. Um, until they test negative twice. So what they do is they go to another nursing home that pledges it can take more people and keep them separate from the permanent population. I've heard outrage from family members. Uh, there's one in particular that let the residents know a week before the new patients were allowed to come in. And that's not enough time for a family member to transport someone who I know of someone who's 98. It's not that easy to take someone out of a nursing home at that state and find a place for them to live safely. It sounds super dangerous. What have you heard from people who have family in these nursing homes? I've spoken to a few, and one of them is Barbara Fleming, and she used to visit her mother pretty much on a daily basis. 
one of the head nurses came in and told me that visiting would have to stop until things calmed down with COVID. So, you know, it was really difficult. My mom and I both cried as we held each other and didn't know how long it would be until we were able to see each other again. And her mother fell ill and died at a hospital. My heart felt like it had broken into two. I would never see my mom again. I was hurt. I was angry because someone at the rehab had infected my mom. And all I could think of is how could this have happened to my mom who was healthy and happy and loved life so much. Then they called me from the rehab and told me that I had a week to pick up my mom's stuff, um, that they would box it up and that I had one week, which I'm afraid to go do because the place is covered in COVID. There's, everybody's got it now. And so she just said she's just going to keep what she had of her mother and those belongings are just, she'll never get them. This just feels sort of inexplicably irresponsible. Like, all of this could have been avoided. And Governor DeSantis isn't really changing his game plan on anything? Well, the one change that I see is that um, he's really focused on improving the testing situation. And unfortunately, for the last few days, testing was shut down at the state-funded sites because of the tropical storm Isaias, but um, he is implementing these fast lanes at those sites where people who have symptoms or who are 65 and older and also children can get tested quicker and um, they can get results in 15 minutes. But Governor Ron DeSantis has he won't put a, a statewide mask mandate in place and he also uh, wanted schools to open by a certain date in August. And um, so uh, um, what I see is not not really the level of urgency uh, that this pandemic requires. Veronica Salagovia reports on health care for WLRN. After the break, I'll ask Vox's healthcare reporter Dylan Scott why the United States is so unabashedly bad at dealing with COVID-19. Support for the show today does not come from the Michelle Obama podcast. It comes from the Jordan Harbinger show, which Apple happened to name one of the best podcasts of 2018. So, sorry, objectives to your... By the way, his name... X. Today, I'll be working... In Florida. I'm driving most of this summer. We're doing also bad. Dylan Scott, you report on healthcare here at Vox. We just heard from Veronica about how bad things have gotten in Florida. How's the rest of the country doing? Also bad? Yeah, not great. Um, we've still got states like uh, Arizona and California and Texas, which have had a really high level of cases through most of the summer. They've been driving most of this summer wave, uh, and their cases are still high, uh, even if they appear to maybe have peaked and are starting to plateau or even dip a little bit. You know, it's we shouldn't take too much comfort in that news because the level of infections in those states are still really high. And even more troubling is we're starting to see some new hotspots start to emerge uh, in states like Alabama and Mississippi. Uh, some of the metrics that public health experts watch to get a sense of how a state's outbreak is progressing don't look particularly good in those other southern states. And so I think what we'll be watching here over the next few weeks is that even if uh, infections start to subside in those big four, uh, Arizona, Florida, California, and Texas, there are going to be some other places where the virus is starting to flare up. And this was pretty much the case the last time we had you on the show. We were talking about big new spikes in states like California, Texas, Arizona. Of course, you're saying it's now moving to Alabama, Mississippi. But what else is changing about how this pandemic is spreading throughout the country right now? 
I know I told you that we could expect deaths to start to pick up after a few weeks because there's just this long lag between when somebody gets infected with COVID-19, when they might develop symptoms that are severe enough for them to end up in the hospital, and then the time that it might take them to actually die. You know, that process can take a month or longer. And so, yes, uh, a month ago, everybody was talking about how cases were rising, but deaths were still falling. And then pretty quickly, the death toll started to increase again. And now we are averaging over a thousand deaths a day uh, for the first time since May. And because deaths are a lagging indicator, even though uh, nationally cases seem to be plateauing again, I think we can expect the death counts to remain high for a while now because, you know, deaths tend to reflect the state of a pandemic, you know, four or five, six weeks ago. I guess one of the few things the country might have going for it is experience. We've been battling this pandemic for six, seven months now. Have we learned anything? Are we getting any better at fighting it, at testing it, at tracing it, or are we just doomed, Dylan? (laughs) We're not doomed. We have learned a lot. I think there's a few different ways to think about this question. There are therapies like remdesivir, like dexamethasone, that have been shown to improve outcomes for people who have already developed severe symptoms that are in the hospital and might have ended up on a ventilator. We know that if we give them those medications, their outcomes are better. We can get them out of the hospital quicker. That should mean that we hopefully will never see the level of fatalities that we saw back in the spring in New York City when nobody really knew how widespread the virus was and nobody really knew how to treat it. We've come a long way in developing those standards of care, and I think there's good reason to be optimistic that even as deaths are rising, they're not going to rise back to the same levels that we saw during the worst of it in New York. It's just hopefully through some of these interventions that we've discovered, we'll be able to keep deaths at least as low as they can be. How have the politics of this changed in the meanwhile? I mean, President Trump recently reinstated his afternoon press briefings. Was that an admission that this is still a very serious issue that needs the nation's attention? I think so. I mean, for a while, it seemed like the Trump administration's strategy was to pretend that COVID-19 was under control. I think it's under control. I'll tell you what. How? A thousand Americans are dying a day. They are dying. That's true. And you ha- it is what it is. But that doesn't mean we aren't doing everything we can. It's under control as much as you can control it. You know, they wanted to simultaneously declare victory, but also wash their hands of responsibility for any new developments in the pandemic. And I think that that has become untenable just because the chorus of, of experts and even Republican elected officials who have said that the U.S. response has been inadequate uh, is just impossible to ignore. Just a few weeks ago, Mick Mulvaney, the former uh, chief of staff to President Trump, said that the amount of testing being done in the United States was unacceptable. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, who is a Republican, uh, wrote a brutal op-ed in the Washington Post lambasting the Trump administration for its pandemic response. And the polling has been pretty clear that people don't trust what Trump says about the pandemic. They don't approve of the uh, way he's handled the coronavirus response. And so I think all of those things uh, combined just made it unpalatable for the Trump administration to continue pretending as if COVID was under control or it wasn't their responsibility to try to control it. When you are not able to socially distance, wear a mask mask, get a mask, uh, whether you like the mask or not. And so, you know, the best thing that they could think to do was to put the president back in front of the cameras again to try to present some kind of counter narrative uh, to all the negative headlines that people were seeing about, you know, this rise in cases and now the rise in deaths here in the last few weeks. Have the politics around this changed outside of the White House? I mean, is the country, as this spreads, taking it more seriously or our governors, as they're having to deal with this in a more tangible way, starting to take this seriously? Are we learning from our mistakes, Dylan? <laughs> Slowly and fitfully, we do seem to be learning from our mistakes. 
So we saw in Texas, as cases and hospitalizations started to increase, uh, Governor Greg Abbott finally instituted a statewide mask mandate. He closed some bars and other businesses again. Mississippi, uh, Governor Tate Reeves, who has also been, like many Republican governors, very resistant to the idea of a statewide mask mandate, finally issued such an order. So, you know, once circumstances force these politicians' hands, they are reacting. I know that the public health experts would tell you that preemptive action is a lot more important. It's sort of this just almost this paradox where we we do do what's necessary, but not until it's already too late. The U.S. just seems kind of constitutionally unwilling, um, starting right at the top in the White House, with doing the work that is necessary to contain it. Well, thank you for your work. Appreciate your reporting as always. Thank you. Dylan Scott, he's a healthcare reporter for Vox. You can find his work at Vox.com. Our team is currently working on a story about dating during COVID-19. Rumor has it it's kind of hard to do, at least if you're trying to be responsible about it. We want to know what dating from a distance is like, especially if you're in an entirely online-only relationship. If you've fallen in love over FaceTime or Zoom, if you're just writing letters to someone with your favorite pen. Overrated. Overrated. Uh, I was going to say fans at games. During that Clippers-Lakers yeah. <laughs> game, I didn't notice once that, like, like the tip-off happened, and I was like, oh, I'll never think about whether or not they're fans again. And they aren't cutting to the stands. I don't care when they cut to the stands. I don't care that there are, like, people enjoying it. Uh, yeah. Fine. Let, just let me watch the basketball part. I'm in my house. I don't care. Right. It's There's interesting a- because it seems like the being there, it's really noticeable. Like, for the players and mm-hmm. the people who are doing the game at the game, they're like, this feels so weird. It feels like you're at basketball camp or, like, you know, just in a gym. But watching it, yeah, you can't really tell. They have the the fan noise piped in a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, that's that was also kind of it's kind of incongruous with baseball, is not the fan noise? But I also two innings in, I did I stopped noticing that there's no one in the stadium. Right. Yeah. It's just again, like we were saying, I think on the last episode about how like so many professional sports that are being played now, they just have the vibe of like community college sporting events because there's right. no there's yeah. no audience. Yeah, you yeah, hear yeah, coaches yeah. scream, sneakers squeaking. Yeah. I do like though that it seems like the audio feed they'd have to dump just so they weren't violating <laughs> any, like, sort of uh, FCC, like, profanity laws. Because there were times, like, a ball would go out of bounds, and you hear someone go like, oh, co-! and then the sound would just dump <laughs> yeah, for, like, yeah, five yeah. seconds, and then come back up, and you're like, oh, what were they saying? Cause yeah, you know, not many switch. people know that in the bubble they have voice actors who come in and do, they're like, <laughs> oh, shampoo me! <laughs> and just come in for, uh, for those uh, curses. Come on, um, ref! You're meeting a stranger in the Alps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, the NBA end of last week. A lot of, a lot of fun. It was good to, good to have it back. I feel like the players, you know, they, they're professionals. They're not losing anything. Like maybe, maybe uh, lackluster teams who, you know, have let's say a historically big difference between. How they play at home versus how they play on the road will not be quite as good in this atmosphere. Uh, Sixers. Uh, but uh, I'm worried. Uh, they, as we record this, I haven't seen the result of the Sixers game over the weekend. But that was something that I was thinking of. Uh, 538 actually raised the Sixers' uh, chances of winning the title the most when uh, the, the quarantine happened. And now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, well, if they played the worst on the road when nobody's cheering for them, like they, for people who don't know, the Sixers were like 10 and 22 on the road and then like almost undefeated at home. Right. Um, I'm just wondering like how that's going to break out. Like what it's, what, it's the most on the road you could possibly be. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, on the road extrapolated a hundred times. Right. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see how that works out for them. JJ Reddick looking good though. Uh, all the all the beer shot gunning. Do you think there are going to be any players who like they're they're completely find their zone because there are no fans? 
I mean, it would like JJ. You know what Reddick's I mean? Where it's like, like what is surprisingly, happening to this person? You know, JJ Reddick's just like a, a shooting specialist, but he had yeah. a couple moves that like blew up on Twitter. People were like, "What is yeah. that?" Like he like <laughs> faked one way through a no look pass the other, like Magic Johnson. People were like, "What? How did?" Well, I wonder if like going to Duke for so long, you get so used to verbal abuse that the oh, yeah. second it's not <laughs> yeah. there, it's like That's you right. can like now use another part of your brain to play. You're like, uh, I was using about twenty percent to just yeah. block out people to focus. Him and Shane like, Battier were, like, officially the most hated basketball players yeah. in the world for yeah. entire decades. So I'm sure Christian Leitner, it didn't work out so well for, but uh, those guys. Do you think sure. any, like, past choke artists are, like, watching this? Like, I could have done this. This would have been, like, <laughs> like Nick <laughs> Anderson Weber. is, like, turning yeah. over a table. Like, he's so yeah. mad he doesn't get to just go in there. Yeah. Anyways, it, it'll be interesting. And uh, I will continue to watch all the clever ways uh, they find uh, shotgun beers um, <laughs> in the in the bubble. So what you're about to hear the the audio quality <laughs> uh, the audio quality is not great coming from uh, our good friend Chris Crofton. It's a full on Chris Crofton episode. Uh, Chris is a total wild card, and that extends to his audio uh, in this episode. Yeah. So just brace your ears because we figured rather than have everyone tweet us to make sure we know what we're going to yes, we do. We uh, but that's the cold brew chaos that Mr. Crofton brings. Uh, he is speaking into a microphone the whole time. Uh, we are forced to assume <laughs> so wild. that the microphone was plugged into his belly button or uh, just a, a house plant nearby or something uh, because yeah. it didn't, did not uh, come through. Um, but anyways, Either fun way, episode yeah, as always it, with Chris. What is a what's a myth, Chris? What's something people think is true? You know, to a be myth. Oh, yeah, I don't know. If I, I, oh, I think some people probably think Glass Houses by Billy Joel, that album, is the best movie ever made. Uh, that was the best movie ever made. Uh, I can share that myth and tell you it's the besides the hiking is the only thing that's been keeping me going. If anyone wants to get get this pandemic in the ass and get a, a fresh perspective, just blast off for Lena. And get out on the trail. Meet <laughs> a woman who's who's who, and meet a woman who's left her backpack in a tree in the middle of the night. And go take her there and help her out. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't I can know, also any... I can also vouch for all of that. Yep. Well, I, I, How I met no, my I, wife. Is that yeah, album content? I don't I don't know the <laughs> Billy Joel discography enough. Is is Glass Houses seen as just a shit album? No, it's not. It's just, uh, but it's not as it's not considered one of the most powerful elixirs on the earth. Right, right. right. <laughs> I, I love John. One of the most powerful elixirs is, on the earth. Which it is. Which, Thank uh, you. It, Don't ask it, me why is one of my favorite Billy Joel songs. I, I was oh, wow. more of a Greatest Hits fan growing okay. up, but... Uh, well, you're a little it, younger, yeah. Glass Houses yeah. well, came out in 1980, so I was like in sixth, fifth grade, probably. So, I mean, it's not like I'm not... I wasn't like in the arena with a lighter. Right. But right, right. Uh, but I did. But that record had. Um, you may be right. I may, I may be, crazy, be crazy, but it but just may just be a lunatic oh you're looking for. I mean, like just like it's all toxic masculinity. But everything before you know, like 2000, actually, to, whatever. It's all to, the toxic stuff if you really exam, <laughs> examine it. But um, but uh, you know, all it's all just like. If you want a man, it's a little unpredictable. <laughs> right, right. It's like you're describing a really unstable relationship. Yeah, yeah, no, it's all that. It's all that shit. It's just like if you look at it now, it's just like the same. It's like God, women must have been so annoyed through every period of time until, well, pretty much now until too. Now, but for, uh, yeah, like it's amazing because men listen, shut the, the fuck just, up. Yeah, they just had to listen to men be like, "I'm horny in a little bit." <laughs> It's also a great example of, uh, <laughs> like, just sums up Billy Joel in the sense that it's full of really, like, great songs, uh, but it also, like, the, the album cover sum, sums up, like, what's not cool about Billy Joel, because it it is, uh, it's called Glass Houses, and the cover is a shot from behind of him holding a rock, getting ready to throw it into a glass house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and his like, throwing so form is those. off, though. His I throwing form, a, bad. Oh, yeah. He's a, he's a, yeah, he's a kind of a little misshapen kind of a man. Yeah. Uh, but he, uh, he, uh, 
that's his house. I, I, I like looked into the liner notes. Like I don't know if they had a big <laughs> glass wall, but he's like, he's like, I realized when I was writing oh, the record, I lived in a glass house. Oh my god. <laughs> Chuck Klosterman, uh, at that point, like you're like the journalist, you're like, dude, shut the fuck up. Dude. Right, no, Thank no, you. Oh, that's oh like, wow. Oh, and you know he's old ass. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah like at a cocktail party or whatever. Like, you went and you won't something. believe this. Some As I'm writing like, don't it, don't say it. He's gonna say it. Don't say it. He's gonna say it. <laughs> Christy Brinkley. I actually, yeah. uh, turns out the title of my record. Oh no, he's gonna say the same oh, thing fuck. he said in Rolling Stone. Yeah, he um, sold 7.1 million copies in the U.S. alone. Uh, it's it's interesting. I, there's a great uh, Chuck Klosterman essay about uh, Billy Joel and Bruce Springsteen, like comparing the two of them and how, you know, Billy Joel is, you know, sold about the same amount of records at their peak. Uh, songs, like if you look at them song for song, they both have like comparably really good, like uh, songs that stand the test of time. But like Billy Joel's just like not cool. <laughs> so he just yeah. like doesn't get the respect that uh, that Bruce Springsteen he, does. He doesn't have like that folklore hero like vibe to him, right? Exactly. Billy Joel yeah. on on this album cover is wearing boot cut jeans. I feel like you'd never see Bruce Springsteen in boot cut jeans. Uh, he, well, he I think just... Billy Joel had a little bit of problem with dre- getting dressed because he he is like a he's kind of shaped weird. He's very small. Yeah. Um, I think he just had trouble. Probably his, his stylist probably didn't know what to do with him, so they, they kind of yeah. like was all. They were always kind of like try try these. Boot cut He's like, jeans do I always have to wear boot cut jeans? Yeah, the stylist like, always was. I don't know. Otherwise, really. they'll see the stilts. Just yeah, cuff them. Just like, cuff them. He was like, does this look good? And the stylist was like, yeah, good enough, yeah. I guess. Look, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not Springsteen, man. I wouldn't think about it too much. <laughs> but I uh, love Billy Joel for real. He's a great songwriter, I and I recommend I recommend that record, and I recommend especially All for Lena. That song, All for Lena. Go on a hike and put on All for Lena, and uh, and uh, just do, do your best. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> and do okay. your best. Do your best. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. Listen, that's how I grew up. I was the kid in the house that had to like make it so my parents didn't get divorced. So for me, this is a very hard time. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm telling everybody how. I'm not kidding. I was the kid in the house that my parents were like, we're going to get divorced unless you do a joke. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. It was like that kind of thing. And then I would, like, do a joke or whatever, and they'd be like, you saved our marriage. So for me, this time, is just like, I'm always like, there's a way to look at it where it's going to be okay, Mom. <laughs> well, and I'm sure that hasn't hey. tinged your engagement with comedy as a career in any way, negatively. No, probably not. I don't think so. Great. <laughs> What is a what's a myth? What's something people think is true, or something uh, vice versa? Okay, this might be controversial, but uh, but I think a myth is the fact that diversity or representation are the ways to solve racial problems necessarily. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know? and I think main evidence of that is that uh, Jeffrey Epstein's island did not allow black girls. <laughs> <laughs> what, what for real? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Put out a I, I mean, I noticed I noticed a mo- uh, an aesthetic in a lot of the photos mm-hmm. that I saw. But wow, there that is, is a motif. Yeah. 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 My wife yeah. is Korean. She just watched the filthy uh, rich documentary. She was like, "He really uh, had a type." I was kind of yeah. glad that it wasn't uh, Korean girls. Yeah. And it's like, would diversity have made this whole situation better? I don't right. think so. Right. Right. You know. <laughs> right. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. That. But I think the also the reason why a lot of people think just inclusion or representation is like the answer is because you don't have to upend the systemic you know yeah the, absolutely the, the structures that maintain these these uh, forms of oppression and racism <laughs> absolutely like, okay well i'm not going to sort of look into my pay scales and things like that and the numbers of people i employ but how about this i will green light three shows with black people right or i will, I will, I will hire one black pa right exactly who works in a different room from the one black writer so they never actually meet each other. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. That's always funny when you like you're on a set and you see the other black person. Oh like, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold on, hold on, hold on! Stop, stop, stop! Stop, stop the go car! Stop the go car! Hey, hey, hey! Oli, hey, how you doing, you, man? You like, cut, cut, yeah. cut! <laughs> yeah, I'm like, how you doing? He's like, are you the director? It's like, no, I'm, I'm Lavar Burton's nephew, and I'm like, okay, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, I'm just here visiting. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, okay, cool. How are you liking it? He's like, mm, not for me. I'm like, fair. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, I just, our, I just feel like I've watched enough anime that have, like, one black character where I'm just like, he didn't need to be there. 
I would have yeah. enjoyed it more well, without him. And also, J- J- Japanese culture has a very, you know, fucked up relationship with fetishizing blackness, too. So oh, it's, yeah. uh, it does, it's not a, they're not going to get the, the most even-handed representations on those <laughs> things, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've done videos on it, but you know what? I don't think they're working. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's it's hard. It's, you know, a island nation mentality, and people just have this thing of like, well, it's not violent racism. It's just, yeah. it's just, re- it's just violent othering of people. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And being absolutely dismissive. I mean, it, this happens with foreigners in, in general, especially if you have something to say on societal issues in Japanese culture, where if you have a platform and you say something, the immediate thing is like, well, they're not Japanese. And, you know, yeah. thank you for, even though this person was raised here and speaks mm-hmm. the language and works here and knows the country, they're like, but... You know, but you know, this steps every everywhere steps. you go. We gotta make steps. Yeah. Go. yeah, small strides. All right, guys, let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Heidi Murkoff, host of What to Expect, a new podcast from iHeartRadio. When I first wrote What to Expect, when you're expecting, my mission was simple: to help parents know what to expect. the worst ad I've ever heard. Of course that's what your show is about. Of, of course with the tap. Never mind. Guys, we did it. We listened to the news. Sort of. It was kind of shitty today. We did our yoga. And we listened to a whole episode of Today Explained. And half of, like, you know, the best of the Daily Zeitgeist. Great podcast, by the way. All we need now is an affirmation to pick up the garbage that the raccoon dropped fighting my cat. Good job, cat. I hope you're okay. I haven't seen him today. Or not to pick up the garbage that the raccoon dropped fighting the cat. Good job, cat. I haven't seen him today. Noodle, don't noodle. You're too worried about what once was and not what will be. However, there's a saying. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow's a mystery, but today is a gift. So how we call it the present. Guys, thank you so much for joining. Shout out to Kung Fu Panda. Still quoting you from day one. <laughs> I will talk to you guys later. Have a good day.